So my name's uh, Martin Richards, I'm from Ragleton. Uh This is Nikki Scott, uh, aka Dr. Compost. Uh, I'm going to use that term because um, people may know you from previously from Dr. Compost. Um, so I wanted to have a chat with you today to understand a lot about the history of composting with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, you've got so much experience underneath your belt. People like myself have just come into, into this recently, last sort of three years. Uh, I think it's really important that we learn, you know, from what you what you've uh, you know you already know, tried and tested. Um, but also, you've got some exciting projects which are mm -hmm. which are, are coming about, which um, I'm sure our listeners yeah. would love to to hear. Um, so to begin with, um, Nikki, uh, what inspired you to to start composting way back then? Uh, well, way back when I was uh, still at school, I went to Dartington School, and one of the teachers there had a composting business in Ipplepen just outside Tonkness, and he used to go around collecting stuff from the markets and anything that was compostable, he would collect it and he'd take it back to his site. This is the good old days before you had all these regulations. Was things. there a horse and car back then? Are we going back too far <laughs> Not now? Not quite that far. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and he'd get a load of spent mushroom compost and mix it all, all up, um, compost it, and then bag it up. So I just had a Saturday job putting it in bags. But he was called Dick Kitto, and he wrote a book about composting and he wrote one on organic gardening as well okay and he set up lots of projects so he was very inspirational for me in lots of ways he set up um, lower shore farm which is still going or he was one of the people that did that and uh, yeah he he basically taught me that there was value in everything there's no such thing as waste everything for dick kitto was useful yeah so that he was a real inspiration and i went to art college and had a very miserable, unhappy time. And I went to see him afterwards. And he said, what the hell? Why don't you go and study um, organic um, horticulture? So he persuaded me to get in touch with Henry Doubledays, as it was then. It's now Garden Organic. Yeah. And so I went there. And, and then I learned all about no dig and the value of compost and human manure and compost toilets and comfrey juice. And it was great. It yeah. was great. And then when I finished with, with that, um, I set up a market garden. Okay. on the edge of Dartmoor, um, which was short-lived, but there's a whole other story there. Um, <laughs> and, then, um, and then years later, I, um, when, I, when I actually moved here um, to this house, that was in 1990, um, we, we were scavenging a lot of stuff, doing up this house from um, skips in the car park. So they had build they had like four builder skips there, and people were rummaging through to get things. We got all sorts of things for the house, but people were coming along and tipping grass cuttings in and hedge prunings, and I thought this is crazy. Partly it was spoiling my rummaging experience, um, but anyway, I rang up the county council and said, um, "Why don't you dedicate one of the skips for compostable materials, and you know, and then don't even take it away. We'll have it. We'll use it for um, on the allotments, and we'll make compost and." It would be great for our no dig systems. Well, yeah. my no dig system, yeah, it was perfectly. I was quite. I mean, you were looking after yourself in respect to. Oh yeah, know, it was <laughs> totally selfish yeah. at first, and and he said, I, luckily, I got through to the guy who had just written the Devon County Council sort of waste strategy. They put me in onto him, and he thought it was a great idea, um, but he said you can't do it on your own. You have to have a group, so you have to form a group. And do it so I got some other allotment holders who, who were keen on the idea and we started this little voluntary group as it was at first and um, they, we got a bit of money we got like 600 quid it wasn't much but we got a bit of money uh, and we, we started off and it was all very chaotic so a lot of what I've learned is through doing it wrong you know all the mistakes you know everything you do wrong then you learn through doing mistakes if you don't yeah and that, that's the thing is that um, the best uh, the best uh, failures are the best learners. Yeah, because <laughs> you as don't want to do it does, again. As long as it doesn't put you off too much. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very true. That's very true. And, and I think ignorance was bliss too. If I'd known all the hoops I had to jump through, mm. you know, legal things, I just didn't know about it. So that made it a lot easier. So to give uh, the, the listeners and uh, the, the watchers a bit of background of obviously how we got introduced, mm. um, I went to one of your uh, compost seminars in Exeter. We kind of knew each other in passing but we hadn't really had a, mm. had a conversation and you were presenting to to uh to a group in exeter and uh it was just interesting to to hear kind of your your experiences of uh you know uh of the hoops and the hurdles etc so you know in agriton we're we're trying to get the uh the government to understand that fermentation is a 
it's a good thing, it's not a bad thing. Mm. Uh, and that's how we started having conversation because, you know, obviously this was something, um, uh, you know, that was something you want to explore. But what I liked about when you were talking to, to people about it is that simplicity is key. And mm. I think this is a thing with, with composting and general kind of gardening generally is that people get really put off because it's yeah. too complicated. Yeah. Um, so for beginners, uh, what, do you, what would you give, you know, if you were going to give some very basic advice, what would be the basic principles of composting? Yeah, well, you've seen me do my talk, haven't you? And I've yep. got the two, the two tins. I've got two tins. One's got air written on it and one's got water written on it. Yeah. And the, in the air tin, it's full of wood chips, usually, and bits of twig and dry stuff like that. And then the water one's full of grass cuttings and green green leaves and orange peel, banana peel, whatever, kitchen stuff as well. And it's, the, so it's air and water I talk about. Most people talk about browns and greens or carbon and nitrogen. But I talk about air and water because I think conceptually it's a lot easier because it's a biological process, not a chemical process. Very uh, true. And so if you can understand the biology, if you know that all the biology needs air and water, every time you're putting something onto your compost heap, you think if you're just piling on grass cuttings, it just turns into sludge, doesn't it? So, But if you've got a pile of wood chip there, you can, you can layer it in. And you can, of course, you can stockpile that wood chippy stuff twiggy stuff, shreddings, whatever you can get hold of. I went to a campsite, a guy down the road's got a campsite, and uh, he, he wanted to know what to do, and he had a mountain of grass cuttings. And in fact, he jumped on top of it to show me, and he sank into it. Oh, it was right. really disgusting. What was the smell like? It was horrible, really <laughs> horrible. And then he had a, but I said, you've got the solution right here, loads of leaf moulds in a little bit of scrub, and he had chippings that they put down on the path. And a pile of chippings, a pile of leaf mould, and a pile of, I said, all you've got to do is put these two together, and you've got the air from one and the, and the squidgy, watery stuff, mix it together, and you've got compost. And then he, he was so pleased, earlier, uh, well, last year now, He's, he brought me a trailer load of compost oh, back to, his, you. to put on the allotment. Lovely. He's so excited about it. And now I'm getting onto meadows and sowing rattle and stuff. So, yeah. Cool. And that's the thing is that I, and, and uh, what I, I love about your presentations is that the simplicity is key. Yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, even I'm one of a, a culprit for it because I'm, I'm starting to know lots more and every day is a learning day. I want to tell everyone about everything, yeah. but actually sometimes it's, the simplicity is quite an important it's thing. Going so. back to the simple, because I mean, yeah, I'm the same. I, the more I've learned about compost, the more I realise I don't know. Mm. And uh, but you know it doesn't put you shouldn't put you off that. No, and nature is a cool thing because when we start to learn more, we then realise we don't know as much as we uh, think we do. And uh, definitely, soil uh, has mm. has uh, you know in the last twenty years. Uh, luckily, the, especially from the agricultural side, people are now starting to understand the value of it. Not quick enough, obviously. Um, you know we're still a long way away from people understanding yeah. to look after the soil, but. You know, in the future, um, I'm hoping that people kind of understand that, you know, that's where our food's coming from. Mm. That's the basis of everything. So, yeah, just to try and keep it as simple with, you know, composting at home is quite an important thing. Um, now, the big one for, for me is, you know, the uh, environmental benefits of composting. Um, you know, mm. uh, uh, what's your kind of take on environmental impacts of composting? Well, you just said it really about the, the, the way it links to the soil. And I remember probably about the time we were starting the project hearing, which is 1992, hearing a Radio 4 programme about soils that were classified as dead. Um, and, you know, that's so the most important thing is to have healthy soils. And it, it does annoy me that people say, oh, well, compost only a soil improver, as if that's a marginal thing. Mm. I mean, what can be more important than improving your soils so that they're holding, they're helping to sequester carbon for a start, they hold on to water. So with all this heavy rainfall we've been having, a good healthy soil is going to hold on to onto that. So farmers that are doing minimal tillage, not not ploughing it up, um, the the water's going to run clear from their land if they're doing it properly. It should yep. be clear, not not muddy, and you can see that quite easily with with farms around where they're doing it wrong. Yeah. Um, so those those two are absolutely key. You don't. Um, you know, people talk about it not having great fertilising value, for instance. Well, you know, who needs fertiliser when you've got healthy soil? Because most of that is coming from through photosynthesis and all the rest of it. So the, the soil food web is just so incredibly complicated. And there's even one school, you know, the Shumi, the Japanese school, 
They don't rotate. They don't add anything. They just chop and drop. Yeah. And they're growing incredible crops all the time. And, you know. And this is the thing is that I think, you know, the more we understand that Mother Nature has its own kind of way of doing stuff, mm. but it doesn't do it individually. It does it as a dynamic of, of everything yeah. happening. Yeah. I think that's a, the key thing. And, you know, one thing I, I, I've learned from yourself is that, um, you know, healthy soil doesn't have to be complicated. The yeah. problem that we have in the UK, as you're very aware, is that we are living in a society where these soils have been, you know, they're within an inch of our lives. You know, yeah. it's like like some of the soils I see in, in yeah. the southeast are, you might have, might as well be in Mars. It's yeah. you know they are just being deprived. But and I hope you agree with me with this. It doesn't mean that they can't come back. No, exactly, exactly. They can all be. They can be restored. Yeah. It's going to take take time. Yeah. But, you know, there's new techniques like using biochar and uh, all these things that are, that are happening. What what you're doing with Agriton with the with Bakashi, you know, that's a huge thing because you do retain a lot more of the fertility that way. Um, you know, I think there's there's not just one one size fits all. It's a it's very complex, but it's not complicated. No, and I, I think this is the thing: is that if we if we use a bit, oh, it's like our own diet, isn't it? Mm. As much as I want to eat rice every day, rice could near enough you know as a, as a stable kind of part of my diet mm. could be a, an old everything but we, we're diverse ourselves we like a bit of taste and obviously mm. we like a bit of a, 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 di a diversity but also it's those micronutrients it's those you know the vitamins and minerals and mm. and the microbiome in our own gut no different to, to our yeah. soil yeah. and you know but what i'm loving now is that there's so much research about you know people that put their hands in the soil i'm gonna look at you because you're always a happy person so <laughs> um you know there's a lot of research now that people are, are, are showing that actually having your hands in dirt i'm gonna call mm. it dirt or whatever um you know there's a lot of science now saying that those microbes and etc do the work and i loved your comment about biologically uh, biological in respects to composting because I think people forget that there are living organisms mm. that are doing all the work you know from s things you can see to yeah. things you can't see yeah yeah exactly which is why I was saying to you earlier before we started recording I'm making trying to make this little film to show what's in there because you can't see the main part of what's happening you only see the big stuff don't you the worms and the odd beetle and you know whatever uh, but you can see little springtails. When, when I was doing a talk at a school once, and a, a, we, I was just showing the children how all around the compost bin there were these tiny little orange mites that were all moving, just looked like a layer of dust. And then the teacher came along, hadn't heard that bit, and she just wiped her finger along, thinking she was cleaning up a bit of really? dust. And we went, ah! You know, just killed Oof. off countless mites there. <laughs> yep. Because all those little specks of dust had legs. Yeah. yeah, and as a, uh, you know, I think the more we educate children on this, uh, you know, we discussed before we, we started the podcast, but I'm happy to put it back on the podcast, is that, you know, I, I, so my background is I, I was trained to become a primary school teacher and actually uh, there's a lot of uh, understanding that teaching now, and this is, a, this is my personal opinion, but, you know, I'm sure Agatha would agree with me, is that we are not an industrial revolution anymore. We are, yeah. you know, we're not that kind of style in, in teaching. And actually the, 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 P, the, you know, the kids that are problem children, et cetera, that go into forest school and you see, you know, dramatic results of them learning. This is where we as a society need to understand that those are skill sets that could be really useful for us to feed people in the future, mm. you know, and, and being able to get kids to be able to do that would be, you know, it would be such a, a good thing to, to have. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you are, and I'm, you know, I look around your house and et cetera, you, you're very in tune with these kind mm -hmm. of things. But unfortunately, we live in a concrete society now where kids are obviously very distracted from... from well, when, yeah, when I started work, when I was working with Devon County Council on community composting stuff, we, we started a project of going into schools because um, with Exeter Airport, um, being sold off they had suddenly had a, a load of money and it had to be spent on environmental you know sustainable projects whatever. and so we came up, came up with this idea of, of putting composting systems into schools all over Devon so we worked in every district of Devon um, including Tall Bay and, and Plymouth every, and Exeter you know every, every authority and doing food waste composting mm. which is kind of ahead of way ahead, ahead of, of its time, time. yeah well it was ahead. way ahead of its time and uh, it's it's proved to be a bit of you know it's a bit of a double-edged sword tricky stuff 
But from on the back of that, we then realised that actually what you really need to do is if you're going to talk about composting, you need to talk about growing, what are you going to do with the compost? So we then started up the Growing Devon Schools Partnership. And um, that's, that's sort of clinging on just about. Um, we haven't got much capacity to do stuff with it. But getting kids outside, like you were saying about the hyperactive kids and things in schools, normally when I've been in and you take those kids outside, as soon as you get them outside, they're just delightful to work with. They're yeah. really nice. And they're engaged and they're interested. Um, you know, they're inquisitive and they're, they're learning. Um, but we teachers are frightened to take kids outside a lot of the time. So they feel <laughs> like they're going to lose control. Yeah. You know. And I think this is the thing is that, uh, you know, as I said, I, I, I did my teacher training. I got three quarters way through. Unfortunately, I didn't, didn't finish it. And the reason why I didn't finish it was because it's very hard for children to to react to you know to 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 what teachers are teaching because the teachers are having to do things to tick boxes yeah and you know as we you know we talk about nature and we talk about compost and etc it's not a tick box exercise no. things are dynamic and you know and we were saying before uh, that actually the best way to learn is from your mistakes and actually that's human nature yeah. you know and i think children have definitely lost that as a skill uh, in respects to to, yeah. to that as a skill, we're so. not allowed to to get things wrong. No, you have to get it right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm hoping with the Dartmoor Multi Academy Trust with this farm, yeah. you know, we'll we'll be able to take kids out onto the farm. They'll be the idea of that is they'll be growing food for the farm. Sadly, the the Invesel composter that we set up at the community college has now gone. Has it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, because these things go in these cycles. They want yeah. to buy another one now. Brilliant. But anyway. Anyway, yeah. Um, so uh, going back to um, uh, the education and community aspect of it, because mm. for me that's quite an important part. Um, you were talking obviously about schools and you, and you, you did uh, quite a lot in schools. Um, looking for the future, what, what um, you were obviously discussing a couple of projects then. Um, what's your kind of your, your, your you know, your, you, you kind of, your, your one that you're really wanting to kind of, you know, let the listeners know you know that, that's happening well i guess the, the south hams project is interesting i've just been asked to write some fact sheets for it and then started writing it and i thought well, hang on i wrote this i wrote this in 1997 originally mm. updated in 2003 and it's all about how to um you know the things thinking of starting up a composting project um planning planning the project selling the idea looking at the legal aspects, health and safety, types of project. I mean, I'm thought, smiling I've at got this it because I haven't seen this before. This is, is the first time I've seen this oh, one. Is it? Is yeah. it? And I'm looking and going, oh. are you uh, trying to tell me don't reinvent the wheel? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess so. But um, I suppose, you know, right from the very beginning, I thought, well, every, every community needs to have its own community composting project because yeah. the, the reasons that we started it originally, well, that I started it, A, of course, I had the background at Henry Doubleday's and was, had an interest in it. But then, uh, as you pointed out, the allotments are right there. We're on a yeah, slope. Yeah, lucky, aren't you? Got the My ones. eldest daughter was born in 1991 and we moved here in 1990. And I was very aware quite soon afterwards that people would have bonfires up there. Yeah. And then smoke would kind of roll down the hill and it would actually penetrate the house and sort of percolate in through to shut all the doors and windows. You get smoke in the house. It's incredibly dangerous, especially for babies. You yeah. Know, really dangerous. So I'd go up. I used to go up there and put fires. I used to take watering. <laughs> we were going up, pouring water onto people's bonfires, getting people shouting at us. And, we, you know, it was it wasn't very nice. But at times, but you know, it's more, more important the health of, my, of our babies, yeah, you know. Yeah. So that was one of the big impetuses to say, well, why are you burning this stuff? This is a valuable resource. You're just turning it into ash, which is of limited value mm. uh, in the soil. You know, it doesn't do anything for soil structure. It's got a few minerals and stuff in it, but you know, use, use it, make it into compost. So we started the community composting on my allotment originally Practice what you preach. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so um, I forgot where I was going with that one now. But anyway. uh, we'd, yeah, we're talking about uh, obviously the um, uh, the composting, the, the project you're doing with South Hams. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So every so every single um, community could have a project. So there's one that's just been set up at Malden, which is on the edge of Torquay, but it's in in uh, South Ham still. So Ben Ben Bryant, who I've worked with, he did Devon Community Recycling Network. And he's part of this Sustainable South Hams project. 
Um, so he's he's set up one in the, in the village where he was uh, where he's been living, uh, where his mum still lives. Um, but there are other ones popping up. So we're trying to get. Well, there are lots of interests. I did. We did a day um, at South Brent, which is we're going to set that up as a demonstration site. And Southampton have got a lot of money to put into. They've got over two hundred grand that they're going to put into uh, community composting because they've been picking it up from people, and it's a lot of money. And mm. you know the carbon um, alone. You know the the carbon miles on those lorries, trucking trucking stuff around when it should be staying in situ and improving the health and of those soils locally so every little and there, there are quite a few projects around there's a few um ones that we set up years ago there's one in ashbrington there's one at, at dartington at hunter's moon um the there used to be some other ones in in south hams yeah so if you if uh, for our listeners uh, uh, if you are you know around the devon area it's a very simple google search you know there are some really good projects that you've, you've done around here Unfortunately, you know, these kind of projects go go under radar a little bit when it when they work and they just kind of potter along underneath the radar. Um, yeah. uh, but, you know, for uh, for moving forward, we all know we have waste issues in, in the UK. We all know that government want to do these big ideas of, you know, trying to, you know, think about green waste and food waste, etc. Um, but, yeah, it's good that you are you and Ben, etc. Are, are there to help direct i mean obviously you know they, these are people that uh, should mm. be really know what they're, they're doing but sometimes they do need a little bit of direction from outside sources um but i think you know for moving forward as uh, south hams as an area it's not many councils that i've heard about in the uk that have been so proactive with it so mm. i'm hoping that no. this will become continue on with you know with what we're doing in the future well they've all got east devon i heard on on the radio the other day um east devon have put money in because for carbon um, saving well obviously composting can come under that as well so yep. it's very good it's not specifically for that and it's for businesses as well as um, groups to, to to benefit from and I think uh, you know a lot every every most council councils have, got, have to come up with a carbon plan so it fits in very very well with that kind of thing proximity I mean it just ticks all the boxes doesn't it you've got the social uh, interaction you're getting groups together you're getting people together you're getting people it's good for their well-being and mental health and everything, working with, with people, doing things. It's good for the soils. It's good environmentally. And it can even turn, it turn into businesses. So our project, which started on my allotment, then, then we had to take over a chunk of, somebody, of, a, of a first allotment. And then we, um, we formed Proper Job as a, uh, as a business and, and expanded our remit to, to reuse and, and recycling and composting. And now and then we finally we bought a site on the edge of town and that's thriving and we've got a shop in town and we did have a cafe and whole food shop for a while for well for 25 years we ran that yeah um, so for people who don't know um so we're in in chagford in devon um and proper job i have personally been to um actually funny enough uh, we were talking about the skips etc um for the listeners um me and nick were talking and um, reminiscing uh, so i used to live in chagford and so oh, I remember, yeah, I, that. Yeah, yeah. I remember that uh, in the 1990s yeah. and I remember um, mm. um, that cafe and I remember that mm. whole, so, whole food shop. Um, but I, I also remember, you know, the, it was, it's a different kind of, uh, it's a different kind of atmosphere here. And maybe it's to do with the amount of nature that's mm. around, etc. People are a little bit more switched on with, with, with recycling. And, you know, I've been down to proper job myself and had a good rummage around it. There's amazing things that you can find mm. in there. Um, but I think we, yeah, we just need as a society definitely to, to stop being wasteful. So yeah. I don't think they were they weren't initially. You know, they, we had a, quite a lot of kickback originally, mm. and I think they just thought we were a bunch of hippies trying to, you know, do things. And, I uh, vaguely you remember know, tree huggers. I vaguely remember. So I'm just I was trying to uh, reminisce the other day. So I was born in 1982, and uh, 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 we were here until 95. And I do, I remember these skips being, uh, being up by the, um, the medical centre. Yeah. Um, yeah, in and the car park. In the yeah. car park there in the corner. And uh, as a, I mean, as a kid, it was quite an exciting thing because mum and dad, I mean, this is when health and safety rules weren't even around. Mm. But I remember rummaging <laughs> through there and having a quick nose about bits and yeah. bobs and pulling things out of it. Yeah. Um, but actually, that, you know, why, 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 you know, obviously 
if you're selling it for a profit, then fair, fair enough, that's, there's a bit, bit of a moral side. But if it's being reused again, I don't see any issues mm-hmm. with that at all. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, you're definitely a good representation of, you know, all the stuff that I see around. You try to reuse as much as you can from, from waste. And, you know, yeah. someone's waste, it doesn't mean it's it's faulty and doesn't work. It just means that maybe yeah. we just don't even like it. So. It's a wasted resource, I call it, rather than waste. It's oh, a like wasted that. resource. I like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've talked about uh, the community project that you're involved with, South Hams. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm really interested in future stuff as well. So uh, what uh, what things have been kind of capturing your eyes in respect of innovation uh, of compost and et cetera? What are the kind of things that you've, you've you know, mm. thought, oh, that's quite interesting? Well, um, I've got more and more interested in biochar, actually. So um, the, the Carolyn Dare, who runs the project on the Blackdown Hills, she's... Um, she works with trim plants nursery next door to where they are and also Plymouth University so I invited her to do a, a little um, online thing through prop job a little talk on biochar um, and in fact I'm, I'm hoping to go up on Saturday they've got they've got an open day um, on Saturday but there's so so much that you can do so some of the community projects now so you can have a, a little stove for instance you can have a stove that produces its own charcoal at the same time as cooking it drops the charcoal out at the bottom so this is really only for outside at the moment a bit like a barbecue but instead of instead of um cooking things on charcoal you're actually producing charcoal through cooking um and that way but for community projects so when i was talking about it with the south brent site they went oh it's brilliant we can have the volunteers we have social time we can cook with the community garden i also run here on the allotment now um, we can do. We can involve people a lot more with the social side of it because although it's a, you know, it's a community garden. Actually, a lot of the people that come kind of got referrals through, through the health centre okay. uh, and that kind of thing. So they're really coming to connect with people and yeah. social time. Be outside, look at the view from the allotment. You right over Meldon and over the moors, over to Coston. It's a great place to to just be you know yeah Chagford area is beautiful it's great it is beautiful um and then if we can we can do a bit of cooking as well same with the schools projects you know we can do that that kind of thing so i i'm all about connecting people place um but also you know doing a bit of gentle teach i mean they learn experiential learning really yeah but if you can cook and and do that and the biochar itself i mean it's phenomenal um and the, the research that's going on in that is, is huge yeah my, and so i've been to i've been to um to that site and yeah. we've had a chat and what i like about it is again just taking waste resources so the big one for me is rhododendrons and and, yeah. and that thing if, if you can create biochar out of out of that yeah. to invent something that's useful i think that's an amazing thing for, yeah. you know to, to to be able to do um you know but and the biodiversity is key mm. you know we need to to understand that carbon is it, it needs to be in the soil it doesn't need yeah. to be you know and it'll stay there pretty much forever once yeah. you've made it i've got here right here i can show you um i've got uh, there's a guy who i know who's a biochar expert and he sent me this in the post and i put it what's that so this was this is uh this is a nitrous oxide cylinder okay that, right you know <laughs> the kids use Re- to yep. the, they chuck them out on the yeah in the laybys and things and he's put a threaded bar through the middle of it um put that on the end you can fill it up so i've been filling this up with anything like hazelnut shells because we had a bumper crop of hazelnuts pistachio shells bits of twig bits of wood i've been putting sawdust in it um stuff like that and then i put that i put it all together and put it in the wood burner and yeah. then fish it out in the morning and it's full of it's full of um, charcoal and then i tip it into my um into my compost caddy kitchen caddy because <laughs> you said to me the other day you were like um so for people that don't know we uh, obviously you know i am you know i work for a company that sells bakashi stuff so obviously i always are interested in it and you said to me oh no i'm not uh, i'm not using bakashi at the moment actually you know charcoal is actually a really good way of, uh, of you know of processing it uh-huh. um and i think you know with, especially with uh with smells and etc it's you know it's a really good resource for, for that yeah. it's interesting you, yeah i mean that's a that's an interesting uh, uh concept because i mean obviously it's just a little I've, thing i've got this one as well little one 
which I've used. It's just a tin with a little hole in the top to let the gases out, and then I fill that. I can fill that with corks or you know. Yeah. Big wine drinker. You have to drink a lot of wine too, <laughs> but it's fine. Such a shame. <laughs> Such a shame. Things you have to do for these yeah. things. Yeah. But you can put anything in it. You know, that's the great thing. Little little bits and pieces. So stuff that wouldn't be. Um, you know, it, it, it stuff. The, the great thing is with one of the biggest challenges with composting and with the community composting is you're dealing with woody materials that you'd have to shred up. You know that people can't deal with. That's why they were having the bonfires because they couldn't work out how you know what to do with it. Yeah. Through community composting, we were getting mobile shredders around. Well, we still do. Mobile shredders can come around to a project, shred up, shred up a load of stuff, and then that can be mixed in for the compost. But that same material. If you dry it out, yeah. you need to dry it out, but you can then char it. Mm, you can turn it into biochar. And I think you know this is the thing: is that uh, biochar has again, it's, it's quite it's not a new technology. It's been around for oh, this, yeah. this, for centuries. Amazonian uh, terra preta, yeah. Yeah, Huge. and uh, you know, if you look at fossilized anything, mm. one thing you do see is fossilized wood. Yeah, and that's normally because it's been burnt. And it's yeah. obviously had a charcoal, so yeah. I mean, just proves yeah. your point that it, it lasts for for a longer period of time. Yeah. I'm really interested in microbial activity. So, um, uh, as a company, obviously, we we uh, we do a lot with affected microorganisms, uh, and there has been uh, quite a lot of research in respect to microbial activity mm. with, with biochar. I can't say anything because we haven't done any tests or mm. anything, um, but we are looking to, to you know to have a look and see what we, you know what, what that looks like because if you can create little homes for those microbes and. Mm. And then put it into the soil. When the soil needs to use it, then they'll, you know, the soil yeah. food web will come and find it. So yeah, yeah, really. Well, interesting. exactly. It's like it's like putting a coral reef in your soil, and you're making these little niches and homes for all these microbes and tiny creatures. Yeah. And fungi. So our, uh, another question. I, I've got a burning question as, as well as soil health. Um, we've kind of mentioned it a little bit in respects to you know we know that there's uh, the soil health. If you were going to give a gardener just a general gardener some advice um, in soil health one how can they tell if they've got good soil mm. and two what can they do to to, to help with, with that well the thing i do a lot with with people that come to the community garden quite a lot of people come and we have what are called starter beds and we we just create them just straight on the ground so it, it, it's no digging so w when i was at henry double days i was put in charge of the double dig beds which was a hell of a lot of work and the guy next to me was in charge of the no dig beds. And then I thought, oh. so I swore that I wouldn't do the double digging anymore. And not only that, it, not only is it a lot of hard work, but it's very da um, damaging to the soil. Mm -hmm. And as you dig, you, you're releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Through no dig, you're not doing that. But to start a no dig system off, um, the easiest way to do it in, that I've found really is to do what's a, a kind of barrier mulching or lasagna technique where you're putting down cardboard first. Yep. And the worst thing about that is taking all the plastic tape plastic. off it, which is a pain. Uh, but putting big sheets of cardboard down is really good. And then layering it with what, whatever you can get hold of, really. I mean, recently we've been doing it, creating some new beds and just putting uh, autumn leaves on it. So we've been going up and down. We've been getting the leaves off the roads, actually. And with the uh, Tragford Conservation Group, they've been picking up leaves. So they wanted a place to get rid of them, so they brought them up to the allotments. So we can just put leaves on, and then the, I get the thatchers to bring um, thatch to me when they're doing stuff. And they're really pleased because otherwise they normally burn it, don't know what to do with it. And people think I'm a bit bonkers. Well, I'm used to that around here anyway. But, you know, <laughs> piles, of, <laughs> piles of thatch, and I put it on, and they go, oh, that's, that's going to suck all the goodness out of the soil. But it's not. And... Uh, in fact, um, one of the, the Thatcher told me that he delivered a load to a market garden nearby. And in the middle of the drought we had, um, was it last year? I can't remember if it was last year or the year before now. Um, it was really hot and dry for a very long time. They, he w w went to take some more straw to this market garden. And they said, come and look at this. They're very excited because it had been hot and dry for weeks. Yeah. And they scraped the, it away, put your hand out. It's cool and cool. damp. You wow. Know, holds it in. Yeah. It's brilliant. And then it slowly gets incorporated by the worms and other microbial life. It's slowly breaking down yeah. and, and, and adding. And you don't get nitrogen robbery because that robbery is only happening at the interface between the soil and the mulch. So it's a tiny bit, but it's not really, it's not really noticeable. Well, it's just the like plants a forest floor, floor really, in the yeah, way it works. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. the leaves. I mean, I normally say to people on the leaves, 
don't rake them up, leave them where they are. And you'll see around my garden, there are leaves everywhere, actually. Yeah. Um, so I'm only rake getting them off the roads and places where there are problem. So that's where we get them. And I think, uh, I mean, you're obviously going to see this, say this in different, see this in a different way, but, you know, if you look at a uh, an, an ornamental garden, for example, mm. and you look at your garden, uh, I would say probably something that I eat from your garden will taste better. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, I know the science behind it. Obviously, microbe activity will make a difference in respects to that nutritional value, but also the taste of it. Um, and this is, it's really hard when you, when you want to have a prim and proper garden and you want your carrots to always be in the same area, um, that diversity is, you know, obviously key. But also, mm. what people see as mess doesn't necessarily mean it's not doing anything yeah. uh, and i think leaf mulch is again is one of those things you know we we as a company we're now collecting it and and bakashing it as a system uh -huh. um and to be honest yeah. most of it's uh done on roads um so actually they're not done in gardens but yeah if you look at no dig and, and no till kind of systems the less movement you have then, then the better yeah what's your allotment like in respects to uh bare soil is it a policy up there or is it um, well, I try and keep my soil covered all the time because it, I'm not 100% uh, on it. I mean, I've, I, um, <coughs> for instance, I grew, um, grow, always grow garlic. Um, it's a great crop to put in, you know, in the autumn. Um, and so you've got something growing. It's, it's, you really want to have stuff growing all the year round. And I, I always think every year, I think I've got to do it better next year, get better yeah. at it. But in between the garlic last year, I sowed carrots and parsnips which i was told not to bother growing here years ago because the badgers come and dig them up yeah um but i thought having been here for all that time i thought oh, i'm going to give it a go and see if these um, give the badgers a treat it's, it's <laughs> yeah at least happy. they'll be happy yeah, they had great carrots and parsnips so i'm still pulling parsnips up out of yeah. the ground i'm still pulling jerusalem artichokes out of the ground uh, as Brilliant. well a few things like that um so the uh, the last question i have for you is future of composting what do you what do you see in the next ten? What, what would you like to see in the next ten years? Well, like I said earlier, I'd like to see ha, have every community um, keeping its own. You know, the, the the councils that are now picking up stuff, you know, which is a bit crazy really, and trucking it around, instead helping people in their own communities to deal with it themselves. You know, which is what South Hams is doing, and um, and Devon uh, generally was doing when I was in post with the community composting. I think we're just a bit ahead, but I think, you know, things have changed, especially in the last five years or so. There's so much more um, understanding and conversations about natural farming, regenerative farming, health of soils, composting, you know, there's, there's just a lot, isn't there? Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, the more we learn, then obviously the less we understand. And mm. that's, that's quite a nice way to, to, to look at it in respect to human you know, interaction with, with, the, with the, you know, the soil, etc. But I think, for, you know, for me personally, the future of composting really is localisation. It's just yeah. keeping it as small as possible. Small and, and local. And small and, and local. And, and people wanted just having it at home. Yeah, I would like to see, and you know, my and my take on future composting. I would like to see law that they have compost um, as part of building standards. Yeah, just like a you know an energy efficiency that people take responsibility. Um, yeah. whatever that looks like, you know, obviously, um, you know, there are, you know, there are loads of ways of, of composting. Um, it doesn't have to take a lot up lots of space mm. either. No, and we haven't talked about urban composting because I've done quite a lot of work with projects in London. Mm. And you know we we had um, in fact going with Bakashi in um, Hackney on the on the Nightingale Estate okay. where they had a huge problem with rats, flies, smell, all the rest of it, and they put in they gave everyone on the these high rise blocks uh, Bakashi bins, and then that and that they 100% compliance, no rats, no you know it was all it was sorted really yeah. quickly. And then they had a little community garden and then they composted it and all the rest of it. And I'd also like to see, uh, like, humanure. You know, like, we have huge... We've got a new development in Chagford. You know, all those houses, all that sewage. And we hear about sewage outfalls into rivers all the time. It's horrendous. Yeah. I've been doing humanure composting here for whatever it is. What's that? 30, over 30 years. Yeah. 
Um, definitely going to do another podcast with you on human manure because I'm <laughs> that's a different, definitely a, a whole, a whole different episode. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, we're in the same agreement. That these all can be localized. Like yeah. you know, they don't have to be national. I think you know, obviously councils are very worried about safety, etc. But when you take responsibility, I mean, I, for me, Bakashi, you know, is is a nice way of showing value of like you know, I put into a bin. Uh, composting is exactly the same you know mm. you put something into into that system and you go you know how much does that cost me and especially with food waste mm. I, I, it's a bit of a game in our house of like how little can we put in because it's obviously that's monetary value mm. um but i think the more people take responsibility the more they'll understand the, the value of it and obviously the value of the other side the other thing i would love to see and this is again i'm just putting out there hopefully councils would listen to this mm. is that you know if you if you dangle that carrot big enough, I, we will give you X amount to set yourself up and we will give you a discount in, in council tax. I'm sure there'd be a lot of people that would want to do that. But mm. actually, I don't feel that that would be any more money for them to, to actually do. Um, but I think, you know, for the future of, of you know, people understanding, we, are in, we live in a chuck waste society and we know that already. And it's not just uh, food waste and green waste, it's, it's everything we do. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I feel that in the future, if people kind of understand that value, because it's literally there, you know, we're we're getting to a point in in the UK where you know I'm sure I don't know if you've seen it on the news yesterday, Riverford um, did a, a big oh, yeah. campaign in in London. Yeah, I saw a guy with the with the scarecrows. Yeah, forty nine percent of farmers are, are are thinking about packing in, and do you know what? I don't blame them. Mm-hmm. You know, these are but this is a living that people you know. Uh, don't really understand the concept of these are fruit and veg and and, and stuff and you know to, to feed you and it's not i appreciate it's not their fault because obviously supermarkets are causing this issue um but it will go to a point where we will not as a society we won't be able to feed ourselves mm. and there is lots of land out there and there's a lots of ways of being able to, to grow well, food yeah i mean this, this the, gov- the governments have basically hand it handed over control of the food system to the supermarkets yeah. the multinationals and sort of wash their hands of it, which is an appalling state of, of affairs. So we, we now, it's the race to the bottom on cheap food, isn't it? And it's a very difficult one to square now because you can't say to people, it's very difficult to say to people, you're not paying enough for your food. <laughs> you know, As we all uh, know, our food bills have gone up. Because yeah. our food bill's gone up, exactly. But yet, at the same time, it's the producers, it's the producers aren't getting the money. All the middle people and the supermarkets are cream, creaming it off. And they... And they force the, the the farmers to do to pay for the bog offs, you know, buy one get one free. Yeah, uh, it's the how producers much is it, that pay for that. But how much is actually eaten? And would, then how much is eaten? Yeah, and so much of that's been shown to be wasted. When you do get a bog off, it's uh, you throw one of them away anyway. Yeah. So actually, what was the point of it buying? Easy. But people also don't understand food. You know, the Jamie Oliver programs showed that, didn't they? That Nutritional value. kids yeah. going into schools in in England and UK. Um, and holding up veg, and children didn't know what it was. When he tried it, did you see it? When he tried it in Italy, yeah. held up a bit. All the kids sort of looked at each other like, who's this idiot yeah. who doesn't know what an aubergine is? Because yeah. <laughs> they all knew. They all knew, of yeah. course. It's a very different culture. So we, we're very, we're, we're, we industrialised earlier, so we're removed from the soil. Yeah. But I think it, it is coming back, and I too see a lot. It gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, gives hope. You it? know, lots of young people getting involved with yeah soil and um, growing yeah um so a shameless plug for you because you've got some books etc available um what uh, if uh, people are interested in, in finding out a bit more about what, uh, what you've done what books have you got that yeah um, well i've got the that was this one's actually been very um um popular and it was actually given away this is don't, yeah. don't let Devon go to waste so they, they bought up and quite a lot of councils bought that that's still available. Um, the, this one that has gone into its all colour edition Ooh, now. Ooh, look at that. Um, originally published by Green Books, all of these, but Green Books has been bought up by Bloomsbury. So this one's available on the Bloomsbury website. And yep. I'm hoping it will be um, um, redone yet again, actually. And I tried to go through like all the different systems that there are as much as possible. Um, and then a section on community composting and a section on schools composting and there's an A to Z section so because I find with a lot of books is that 
think, well, what does it say in that book? You know, and you try and find it. Yeah. So I thought, well, if I put an A to Z guide in the middle, yeah. then you can look up, you know, what does Bikashi again? How does that work? What's biochar? Yeah. yeah. But the great thing is, we, and I mean, obviously, when was that book written? Uh, good question. I can't remember. Uh, when did I first write it? It will say in it. It says copyright 2021, but that's first published 20, 2009. Okay. So you've obviously learned more over the years as well, yeah. so you can add to this book. Um, so for people, um, uh, obviously you're not so digital, uh, you haven't got the socials or anything, but so if people do want to get in contact, uh, get in contact with myself at Agerton UK and we can mm. uh, obviously point in the direction. Well, we've got the, web the website. One of the good things about the South Hams project is they are, um, we have got a bit of money to spend on doing up the website. Lovely. A more. Have you got a website which address just, yet? Yeah. Or? Uh, yeah, it's just the same one. It's just DCCN, which was Devon Community Composting Network. So dccn.org.uk. Brilliant. Um, and there's a lot of advice on that. I've also got a Dr. Compost um site but i think the dccn one is better and it's got videos and um lots of resource materials and it's got things like this as a as a pdf um it's got the uh, the, the newsletters that we used to write we used to write a newsletter called the junk mail so all the archives of that are in there brilliant um it's brilliant. got a whole lot of stuff so if people want to get in contact you then uh, use that website for yeah, for, for him. yeah. That's brilliant. It's been an amazing conversation. Uh, thank you for, for so much for your time. Um, and uh, we'll obviously, hopefully, have another podcast in the future on Human Year. Great. All right, thank yeah, you so much. Happy. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. Cheers.